apart from the local financial institutions, uh, we have learned in Europe that uh, there is also a question of foreign financial institutions who are prepared to approach their own governments uh, to try to persuade uh, the uh, sovereign debtor not to restructure them or to restructure them in a very lenient way. Why did Europe adopt this counterintuitive policy of bailing out all of these countries, except for Greece starting in 2012? Part of the reason was that Northern European banks held great slugs of this paper. And they were importuning their own governments to say, you don't want, it comes down to this, far more palatable to lend Greece the money to repay Commerzbank than it would be for Mrs. Merkel to have to recapitalize Commerzbank directly. Hmm? And uh, so we, we now have that factor uh, in play. It was, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say that this did not exist in the 1980s or 90s. The commercial banks in that era surely uh, importuned uh, the US government and the uh, governments of, of Europe and Japan. Um, and to a degree, they succeeded. Because if you remember what happened throughout the whole of the 1980s, uh, there were no principal write-offs of any of that debt stock. It was perfectly apparent to everyone that the debt was unsustainable, uh, but uh, no one had to accept a write-down of it. Why? Because that would have uh, eroded the uh, stability of the international banking community. And so governments like the United States government applied pressure on the debtor countries uh, to continue the process of paying interest on their debt, uh, even if they had to borrow it from the very banks to whom they were paying it. And then we come to the IMF. So we're talking now about factors that will influence how a sovereign uh, decides it's going to restructure its debt. The IMF is a curious institution, in my view. Uh, it is obsessed with debt-to-GDP ratios, uh, even though uh, debt-to-GDP is perhaps the crudest of all ratios for actually assessing a sovereign's uh, borrowing capacity. Why? Because it scores a euro due tomorrow in the same way it'll score a euro due 40 years from now. Uh, but uh, the IMF economists uh, will often come to the table with this idea that Ruritania, as a result of this process, must restore a debt-to-GDP ratio, usually 60%, uh, as part of the process. And frankly, when the IMF takes that position, the Ruritanian Minister of Finance is going to have few choices other than to salute. Hmm. By the way, I promised historical examples. This was Greece in, uh, on the night of October 26, going into the early morning of 27, in the year of our Lord 2011. Uh, the official sector, by which I mean the IMF and the EU, careened from a policy of having forbidden Greece to restructure one euro of its commercial bank or co uh, commercial bond debt, they were, had been forbidden to do it. They careened at two in the morning of October the 27th to a policy of commanding that Greece restructure what was left of its commercial bond uh, debt in the hands of commercial parties, silent parentheses, excluding the ECB, um, with at least a 50% principal haircut. Uh, and at that point, Greece saluted. Uh, the official sector articulated the result. They did not confide how bondholders were to be persuaded to give up 50% of their claims against Greece. That is the story that Jerome will tell us this afternoon. <laughs> 
There is one interesting development in this area. Um, traditionally, the IMF looked at a country's debt stock and made a decision. It was either sustainable or not. Remember, the IMF staff must tell the board that they believe that the country's debt stock will be sustainable uh, after the program. And traditionally, it was an up or down decision. You either said yes or no. This is Brazil uh, in, and Turkey in the early part of this century. A couple of years ago, the IMF decided they were going to change that policy. So they now have what they call a gray area, where the staff can neither say with a high level of certainty that the debt is sustainable, but nor can they say that it is not sustainable. In that context, uh, the fund will approve what in the jargon is called a reprofiling. A reprofiling is an extension of maturities, sometimes a, an interest rate adjustment, but not a principal haircut at that point. Um, and the idea is stretch out the maturities, and it has the inestimable charm of moving those maturities out of the program period so they do not have to be funded with IMF or, in Europe, EU money. That is the principal charm of it. Uh, they don't want to walk the path that they walked in Europe starting in 2010 again. Uh, but the theory is, let the IMF program do its good work uh, and let us see where the Ruritanian economy is in five years and then we make a decision whether a more durable form of debt relief is needed and if so, the quantity of that debt relief. The logic of it is invincible. Um, the classic case of it, by the way, uh, was Uruguay 2003. So Uruguay, sandwiched in between Argentina and Brazil, was brought down by the travails of its larger neighbors. Uh, Uruguay had been investment grade only six months before. Its coupons on it had 18 bonds issued in the international markets. The coupons were Good, very good uh, at that point in time. And after a considerable debate at the IMF, uh, Uruguay argued that it should only reprofile. It stretched out by five years the maturity date of each of those bonds. So the entire curve moved out five years. The coupons were kept precisely the same. And it worked like a charm. Mm -hmm. uh, 31 days after completing that debt restructuring, Uruguay was able to go back to the bond markets on a purely voluntary basis to be sure they were lending within that five-year window, uh, but Uruguay never had to do anything further, and it has been back to the bond markets 25 or 30 times since, so it worked like a charm. That is a relatively new policy of the IMF, and my guess is we're going to see it used uh, uh, qu quite, quite a bit. There, is, there will be a shadow, of course, over reprofiling or any other form of debt restructuring that is too mild. And the IMF will argue, look, uh, simply kicking the can down the road uh, may be unhelpful if the market looks at you and says, well, we don't know whether the country will have a sustainable debt stock in five years, and we don't know whether they'll be able to do a restructuring at that point. This, then this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The market will not begin to lend again to the country, and all of a sudden it will need to have a more durable debt restructuring. So the counter-argument to reprofiling, when I said the logic of reprofiling is invincible, it is invincible in one, in one sense, but the counter-argument is, no, no, uh, better 
to do what is necessary today to present the market tomorrow with a visibly sustainable position because once you do that, they'll begin to lend into it and allow you to return uh, to the hamster wheel of refinancing. <laughs> Let me move on to and again, we're talking about the issues that the sovereign needs to address at the very outset, the very threshold of its decision to restructure its debt. The next one is one of the most contentious. Uh, and it is, how should the creditor, how, strike that, how should the sovereign debtor interact with its creditors? Once upon a time, in the 1980s and 90s, uh, in those days, the commercial banks would make the argument to every sovereign debtor uh, that wanted to restructure its debt, the argument went something like this. We, your bankers, will never forgive, we will never forget if you restructure us. Mm -hmm. So what you're about to do, minister, is a permanently self-inflicted wound. Uh, it was, at the time it was articulated, uh, nonsense. It has become more so in the era of bond finance. So you will occasionally hear bondholders say, if Ruritania treats us badly, uh, they'll never be able to issue another bond. That is madness. As a matter of fact, uh, first, there is no brotherhood of bondholders. Uh, they will cheerfully slit each other's throat if they can. <laughs> Second, if you think about it, uh, if I'm a prospective lender, bond investor in Ruritania, and you, Ruritania, are in trouble today, it's in my interest that you bring the sword of the Lord to your existing bondholders. The more debt relief you extract from them, the safer my investment tomorrow will be. And so, therefore, the era of never forgive, never forget is surely over. Uh, and uh, that, that constraint is not there. But the question is how to interact with one's creditors. You will hear... Uh, creditors accuse sovereigns all the time of what they like to style take it or leave it offers. Uh, they pretend uh, that the sovereigns uh, ignore them and simply come to them one day with a debt restructuring proposal that either the creditors accept uh, or if they decline, the sovereign says, we will consign you to the outer darkness of perpetual payment default. Uh, and the creditors will say often uh, that that is what happens. It never happens. It never happens. No sovereign will ever restructure its debt without some form of consultation with its creditors. It would be suicidal not to consult with the creditors. Uh, it's not to say that every creditor gets to dictate the terms, uh, but no sovereign will want to launch a transaction that utterly falls on its face, and that would be the risk you would take if you ignored your creditors. But there are two models for how it's done. One model is, uh, to use the jargon, uh, creditor consultation. So under this scenario, the sovereign appoints a financial advisor. The financial advisor goes and speaks to the larger creditors, either individually or in small groups, and takes their temperature. Uh, they're going to be constrained by legal reasons that they can't disclose what the sovereign's going to do, but uh, there will be a series of hypotheticals. Suppose Ruritania were to approach you with a 30% discount. How would you feel about that? The answer will be, first sentence, we won't like it. Uh, 
Uh, but then the second sentence might suggest, but if necessary, we'll swallow that uh, and, 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 and be angry about it. The financial advisor then takes the fruit of that consultation back into the room with the sovereign and the IMF and says, Here's, here are the parameters of a transaction that we think will meet with reasonable market approval. And the IMF, by the way, in its program is probably going to be saying, you must reach, jargon again, a critical mass of creditor participation that's pretty high, 85, 90% typically. And therefore, the creditor consultation and the design of a restructuring proposal <clears throat> that will attract that critical mass becomes absolutely crucial for the sovereign. That's model one. Model two, and this is where it becomes contentious, uh, is ought the sovereign to recognize one or more creditor committees and to negotiate with the creditors? Contrast the two words. Model one is consult with the creditors. Model two is negotiate with the creditors. Now this is contentious because creditors um, believe uh, that they get a better result when they negotiate with a sovereign. History does not say that, does not hold that to be correct, but they believe it. So the benefits for the sovereign of recognizing a creditor committee are these. Uh, first, the committee, if composed of representative creditors, uh, will do the verification. Uh, so they will look at the sovereign's uh, financials, uh, projections, they'll consult with the IMF. They'll do all of that work for the broader bondholder community, and that's enormously useful. Second, uh, Every other bondholder will have the comfort of knowing that the terms of the debt restructuring were negotiated by a group of similarly situated creditors in a room. And therefore, uh, implicitly, uh, they will be told this is the best deal that we could negotiate at the time. The creditor committee, if and when a deal is struck, will be expected to give it a good housekeeping seal of approval. Hmm? So when the deal is presented to the broader bondholder community, it will typically be done in a joint press release with the creditor committee, and it will end with the sentence, uh, the uh, creditor committee for the Ruritanian bondholder committee uh, the members for themselves all expect to accept this restructuring and encourage their fellow bondholders to do the same. That is enormously useful. But there are downsides to recognizing creditor committees and a little bit of history here. One thing you can say about the commercial banks in the 1980s is they were remarkably organized. Uh, so within a week of Mexico announcing uh, its moratorium, there was a, 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 a bank advisory committee for Mexico formed. And that policy was followed for the 24 or 25 other countries that had to restructure their debt in that era. Uh, the bank committees were composed of typically the largest lenders to the debtor country. They had a degree of geographical representation, so there'd always be a Japanese bank, there'd be a couple of European banks, etc. Um, and they negotiated the terms of the restructuring. They even negotiated the legal instruments by which it was uh, carried out. And, and for a few years, it worked wonderfully. Uh, those bank advisory committees exercised sufficient leverage over 
the wider banking community so that we had no holdouts uh, from the banking community. If you were a small bank that decided you wanted to hold out from one of these restructuring packages, the first thing you got was a phone call from the chairman of Citibank uh, saying if you want a, a correspondent banking relationship in New York, uh, you better go along. And if you, if you resisted that, uh, then you got a phone call from your regulator, uh, from the chairman of the Federal Reserve, that says, read my lips. Uh, your Uncle Sam wants you to join this restructuring, and people did it. But, but it broke down. You see, the, the bank advisory committees, when they were first set up, operated on this fatuous assumption uh, that all right-thinking bankers will all think the same all the time. Hmm? And therefore, they established as their ground rule that every major proposition coming before the committee must have unanimous consent. These committees had typically between 12 and 15 members. In the first years of the crisis, when the international banking system was frankly hanging by a thread, the merest thread, uh, it worked. But as the decade rolled on, uh, you began to have defections. The smaller banks no longer wanted to play the game. Uh, some banks uh, under different regulatory regimes like Japan were no longer eager to play the game. And by the time the decade ended, the period of time it took between agreeing a debt restructuring package and getting it signed up with the international banking community had stretched from weeks to years to the point that, most infamously, uh, Brazil agreed a, a Brady restructuring in 1992. They didn't get around to closing it until 1995. Uh, so the system broke down. I remember in Russia, 1998, which was the very end of this, Russia had a, a bank advisory committee like the ones that had been used in the 80s, uh, there was one bank on the committee that refused to go along. Uh, months went by, and finally, uh, Russia essentially fired that bank. That was the only way to do it. And it, even that incident exposed one of the underlying uncertainties about the formation of these committees. Do they form themselves, or does the sovereign debtor uh, anoint them? Um, Second problem, so the first problem is governance of the committee. Uh, we seem to be moving beyond that. These, these committees, one second, these committees will now say that they govern themselves by consensus. Yes, sir. I just wanted to ask, I mean, all these negotiate, ne negotiating, um, the, the London Club and the Paris Club, do they have a role in this? Do they still exist and have a role in, in this stuff? Okay, good question. Uh, the Paris Club uh, refers to uh, the OECD countries that have historically negotiated since 1956 uh, their exposure uh, to emerging market countries. They have negotiated them jointly. Uh, so it isn't really a club. Uh, it is called the Paris Club because they meet under the auspices of the French Treasury, and they've been doing that since 1956. When the uh, debt crisis broke in 1982, uh, the commercial banks began to be called the London Club, uh, just to distinguish them. But there is no London Club as such. When you hear the words London Club, it simply means the commercial creditors rather than the official sector creditors. So the, the correct term is Bank Advisory Committee, right? It, it was in those days. Yeah. Uh, so the, the English called them steering committees, bank steering committees, but, but bank advisory committees were typically the... The second problem is divorce. Uh, once you anoint a committee, uh, how do you... How do you do a deal without their consent? Uh, having anointed them, 
if you then find yourself bogged down for months or years in negotiation and simply must get on with it because the IMF is telling you that the program falls apart unless you do, uh, the idea that you would launch a transaction to the broader bondholder community without the approval of, the, of your bondholder committee uh, is going to be very hazardous, uh, particularly if the committee comes out with a press release, which they will, uh, saying, uh, uh, dear bondholder community, we do not endorse this. Uh, so th this is a risk. Once you're in the room with them, uh, it's uh, till death do us part. And then you have a question of what do you do if one or more of the members of that committee has, to use the American idiom, a bee in its bonnet. Uh, so I remember there was one institution that every time they would join a committee would make it a rule uh, that they would say, Ruritania must also restructure its IMF debt. Now, we couldn't do that, and they knew we couldn't do that, but months would be spent on this issue. I did a restructuring last year, and this, by the way, ties two themes together, for a country that did not have an IMF program. It did not have an IMF program because the prime minister viewed the introduction of the IMF as poisonous to his political career. But without an IMF, playing the role that I described a little while ago of being the, the one who vouchsafes for the information, for the proportionality of the debt relief and all the rest of it, the creditor committee for this country, the bondholder, private sector creditors, decided that they would uh, draft the fiscal adjustment program for the country that they would monitor it on an ongoing, that they would make themselves the IMF. Now, this was utterly unacceptable. Uh, it is one thing to have to uh, raise taxes because some multilateral bureaucrats in Washington tell you to do it. It's quite another thing to do it because some bondholder tells you to raise taxes. Uh, and beating back this demand was very difficult. So you run the risk that once enter into, entering into the room, you will be confronted by demands that you simply cannot, uh, for political reasons, accept. Third concern is um, there will be a preference by these committees uh, for a short-term uh, solution. Their argument will go something like this. Look, we accept that Ruritania has a debt servicing problem, and we accept that it'll probably have it for another few years. But we don't know the future. No one knows the future. Uh, so here is our solution. We will reprofile your maturities. Maybe we'll cut the interest rate for a few years, but then it balloons back. Hmm? Uh, and Minister, one of two things must be true. Either uh, Ruritania will recover its economic footing before the uh, debt begins to amortize and interest rates balloon back, or it won't. If the former, all is well. If the latter, we'll be back in this room in a few years, and we'll do this again. But, the bondholders will say, Minister, Principal haircuts, like true love, are forever. Hmm? Uh, and if we give you uh, a principal haircut today at what we all hope is the nadir of your economic fortunes, uh, and tomorrow it turns out that the sun comes up over Ruritania, we will have given debt relief, permanent debt relief, unnecessarily. Therefore, they will say, uh, let us preserve our claim in terms of its size, defer perhaps the maturity date, and, and if necessary, we'll be back and do this again. This, by the way, has become a little bit of a pattern in the Caribbean. 
So Belize, in the last 10 years, has gone through three debt restructurings. Grenada, three debt restructurings. Jamaica, three debt restructurings. This has become a little bit the pattern. And it is one concern that sovereigns have when they sit down with committees, because the committee will regard its function, yes, to give debt relief that is inescapable, uh, but with the shortest leash possible. Hmm? And the shortest leash from the sovereign standpoint is often a noose. <laughs> final comment, um, two final comments. Uh, in a world of bond indebtedness, uh, those bonds are securities. The syndicated loans of the old days were not regarded under our securities laws as securities. But when you're talking about bonds, they are securities and therefore there will be legal restrictions on both the sovereign debtor and any committee uh, that material non-public information not be disclosed selectively to certain creditors. And this can become a problem with a committee. Uh, they will be asked to sign non-disclosure agreements uh, but many of them uh, these days are going to be hedge funds. Uh, they trade in and out of these bonds in an afternoon. They will not want to be bound indefinitely to cease trading in the bonds if they sit on the committee. And this, is, this has become an issue. The final question is fees. Uh, the committee will ask that the sovereign debtor indemnify it for its legal and financial advisory fees. Uh, at one level, harmless, but uh, in the debt restructuring I did last year, and this was my fault, um, we said we would indemnify reasonable expenses for financial and legal advisors. Well, it turned out that the Bank Advisory Committee, unbeknownst to us, had promised their financial advisors that they would be compensated uh, by a percentage of the amount of debt that was restructured, the way an investment bank would. Uh, and the result was, for about six weeks of desultory work, uh, the financial advisors presented a bill in the millions of dollars. Uh, this was my mistake. I, from now on, uh, any client that I advise who agrees to indemnify expenses of creditor committees will specify that it is parts and labor. Uh, no more X basis points of the amount of debt restructured. And they called it, by the way, a success fee. And I said, what in the love of heaven is a success fee for a financial advisor to a creditor committee? Does it mean you don't do a deal, which is the ultimate success, or is success you negotiate less debt relief than the country needs? And anyway, anyway. But this, I started out by saying that this has become a very contentious issue. It is a very contentious issue. Uh, the uh, International Capital Markets Association, ICMA, uh, came out with some recommended clauses for sovereign bonds, which include a commitment uh, to recognize a creditor committee if a debt restructuring starts in the future and to pay their expenses. Most sovereigns have ignored that. Um, it is not that the sovereigns don't recognize committees, they do. Uh, but contractually committing to do so in advance is, is problematic. Also, and I should have mentioned this, you may have more than one committee. In a large sovereign debt workout, uh, you can have multiple committees, uh, and then you find yourself in the odious position of possibly having to negotiate with different committees, each of which may have differing views, each of which will present you with a bill at the end of it. Uh, Iraq 2005 
there were six committees formed. Um, uh, and the idea that Iraq would have negotiated with each of them was fanciful. Every one of them had one common theme. Every single committee took the view that it should be exempted from the debt restructuring and Iraq should slice the throat of every other committee. They all shared that. Final comment, and then very quick. Even after the sovereign has decided who is an excluded creditor or what the terms are for those that are included, there will be a degree of intercreditor suspicion, jealousy, rivalry. Uh, and there are a variety of mechanisms that have grown up over the years by which different creditor groups try to link themselves in terms of parity with other people. Most infamously is the Paris Club. Every Paris Club deal comes with what they call a comparable treatment covenant. So the sovereign debtor will be obliged to say that it will accord uh, comparable treatment assessed in a net present value sense to all of its other creditor groups, non-Paris club bilaterals and commercials. But there are a variety of things that commercial creditors do. Most infamously, Argentina in 2005 was asked to sign something called a RUFO clause, uh, rights upon future offering. Essentially what it said was if Argentina ever settles with holdout creditors on terms preferential to those that it was forcing on the people who joined the deal, that the, uh, uh, the restructured creditors would get the benefit of that. So there are a variety of techniques by which creditors try to maintain their intercreditor parity. We've got a few minutes, so I'm going to stop there and let you ask a question or make a complaint. <laughs>